I'd like to introduce uh, our uh, chief executive officer, uh, co-founder uh, of Acme Packet, and between him and Pat, the reason we're actually all here. So welcome, Andy. You know, there are days I feel like a science experiment for how much caffeine one can have. Um, I'm going to get you all to sing a song. I know you're kind of hard to believe that, that you're going to do it, but you really will. Trust me. Uli, stand up. Stand up. He's 34 years old today. Let's sing him happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Come on. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Uli. Happy birthday to you. Uli, happy birthday, my friend. You're very welcome. You know, two things cool just happened there. The, the, the first thing, well, I got, I got that out of the way. I, no, but really, the two cool things are that number one, it's community, all right? This is, Dino, thank you all for doing business with us, and I, I, I agree. I mean, we're here because of you. Without you, we would not be here. But I have an ask of all of you in the room, and the ask is not more business. The ask is to invest. And we will walk lockstep with you all and take a giant opportunity and make it reality. And that is done by a community of people. The second thing is you did something you didn't think you were going to do. When I said we're all going to sing a song, you're all like, ah, we're not going to do that. And then when you saw the opportunity was so compelling, you fell into it. And that should be a metaphor for what I think is going to happen moving forward. Let's see. Oh, let's see. I'm, I'm notoriously bad at these things. Oh, here. There's a next and a back. So we, next, let's see how that works. Ah, so we're going to play a little game. Just imagine that we took all of the world's networks, all of them globally, the wireline networks, the wireless networks, the public networks, the private networks, the IP networks, the telephone networks, put them all there into this big pile. And I said, which application generates the most revenue on an annual basis? And some people might say, gaming? No. <laughs> Other people might say, search? No. I mean, Google's a pretty big company. And of course, we all know the right answer. But at this point, by process of elimination, is this voice. And the amazing thing about voice is that it is larger than search, gaming, and social added together multiplied by 10. It's still almost a trillion dollars a year. These others are about $70 billion a year right now. Voice is enormous. Now, when you think about voice, everybody says the ARPU is declining. It is. We're all poster children for this. We all pay less every single year than we have in the past. And the ARPU, the average revenue per user, is going to drop and probably is going to break $10 a month at some point when people are carrying LTE phones or have plans at home integrated in a triple play fashion into their content and their programming. But you know, as Dino says, there's going to be two phones for every one of us, and we're going to be doing other things too. Even at $10 a month, you can build a great business on 5 to 10 billion devices over time. So when you think about it, you have a trillion dollars of annualized revenue from the world's global communication networks delivering an application of voice. And people are racing to move this to IP. And there's really only three big buckets to think about. This is not complicated stuff. Unfortunately, the technology is complicated that we're all putting forth, and getting people to change is difficult. But the market is actually very simple. There's three markets. There's the residential market, there's the business or enterprise market, and there's the mobile consumer. Now, you know, sometimes I feel like the human shield in Mad Max for the rest of the industry when we're all out there trying to figure out how to sell, design, develop, and implement technology, and I got to go talk to investors and try and explain to investors why what Cisco is talking about over-provisioning layer three networks and why what other people, I think F5 recently uh, came out with a statement that said their CEO, who's a good guy and is very smart, said that when 4G happens, there's going to be no need for session border controllers. Now, for the life of me, I can't figure that out. I don't, I don't understand it. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of FUD. There's a lot of people, for their own interests, are talking about things that just don't make sense. And 
I believe that the session delivery network, that uh, control plane technology that participates intimately with the layer three network is going to enable the delivery of these kinds of applications and services and unlock tremendous innovation. But the question I get is why now? And <laughs> you know, it's been, um, it's hard to believe, but it's been almost a quarter century since I met Patrick and we started in the telephone world doing voicemail. And I remember why now. People were still wondering about ISDN. It stood for I still don't know. And they just had no idea. And there were people that were convinced that ISDN was going to take over the world. And of course, it, you know, it did something, but it didn't take over the world. The other one was voice recognition. I remember in 1989, one of the co-founders of Boston Tech came into my office. His name was Scott Jones. He was the chief scientist, and he was really smart. And he put this board. It was like a two-port board, and it was really very cool. It looked like a little miniature city. You know, I, you know, you're looking at that like, wow, look at all these chips, and it's hot as hell. We plugged it into the thing, and you could speak digits. You could say seven, five, two, one, two, three, four, and they'd show up on the screen. And it was hard not to believe his prognostication that we were going to be talking to our machines and the interfaces would change radically. It was, what, a quarter century or so before Siri was born? And even that is still not the reason people buy iPhones? It's pretty unbelievable. So why now here is a very, very germane question. You want to be a leader. You want to create the value that you're, that you're destined to create while you get up in the morning and you toil away year after year. I'm right there with you, walking lockstep with you. But you don't want to be too early because we can think of an endless amount of companies that are too early. I, I am absolutely convinced that the next four to five years in terms of communication technology and interactive communications and applications are going to be transformative. In fact, if you pulled back and took a look at the last 125 to 130 years of interactive communications, you'd see three peaks and only three peaks. The first one you would see would be Watson, Dr. Watson, come here, I need you. And now that was the birth of interactive communications and it was Alexander Graham Bell. The second one is that device with a little kid on it. It was mobile telephony. They knew about it in the 60s, and in the early 80s it became a reality. And AT&T figured when they were Ma Bell and owned everything, they figured in the early 80s that by 1990 there would be a million people using mobile telephony, well, in the United States. By 1990 there were 10 million. When you're off by an order of magnitude at the early stages of a market, that's pretty unbelievable. The third peak is end-to-end -end IP. The reason that end-to-end -end IP is so important is that for the first time we've affected a fundamental separation of the delivery of network connectivity from the services themselves. Completely separated. And when that happens, innovation occurs. And markets are not made by suppliers. They're not made by regulators. They're made by customers. And we've lived in a market called voice telecommunications that didn't really exist as a free market. Regulated, monopolistic, proprietary connectivity. And when you think about it, take a look at the innovation that occurred in telephony and telecommunications in the last 30 years. There's two applications. I mean, forget the star 69 or star 71. I get so confused. If I ever enter something like that, I think I either turned my lights on, turned off my alarm, or put my phone on do not disturb and don't know how to set it back. So I'm never going to use any of that. There's two things. Caller ID and voicemail. And actually, they're pretty darn cool. But in the last 10 years, in the last five years, in the last 12 months, think of the innovation that happened on the IP networks that you use. So here's why now. The, from a residential point of view, people are paying less. I'm paying 50 bucks a month for my phone line. Now, I still have two phone lines. I have one line hooked up for my alarm, but pretty soon that's going to go away. We have one board member, Bob Power, who decided to uh, get rid of, he has a house on the Cape, and so he got rid of his phone line altogether. He just takes his, his wireless phone to the Cape. So when we started this business 12 years ago, everyone had two lines in the United States, pretty close. And then about five years ago, the second line was all gone. Today, there are .75 lines per home. So you've got customer attrition because there are competitors. 
You've got Comcast, and you've got Cox, and Cablevision. You've got people that are providing high-speed connectivity for programming and content, and for internet, and they're bundling in voice. And so people are defecting. You also have people paying less. I am paying much less today than I did five years ago. So with declining ARPU and increased competition and a smaller customer base, does it really make sense to have a high operational cost to service these customers? No. So the two networks, the voice network and the data network, become one network. And if we say choose, which they are, it's not very difficult. Everything is going to be delivered on the lowest operational vehicle, and that's going to be IP. I mean, the, the, the enterprises have the same issue. Now, enterprises are a bit more efficient. You know, they, they're really thinking about how do I take advantage of my cost? How do I increase my productivity? How do I enable my customers inside and outside of my enterprise to align their day-to-day -day tasks with the core value creation imperatives that they have? And clearly, one of those things is to move voice from a very rigid, hard to integrate, completely separate and distinct network and put it onto the IP network. IP is much more flexible, and then we can start to integrate it into what we do. We can save an awful lot of money by consolidating all those business trunks we have, putting them into data centers, and then you can start to run on your own backbone. So when you're doing conferencing and you're doing video, I mean, uh, Peter, it's, Peter, you're here. How much money do we spend a month on conferencing? Is it twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month? How much? Twenty-five thousand dollars a month. We're a little company. What do you think HP spends on conferencing, or Cisco, or Microsoft? It's an enormous amount of money. You, there are huge savings. There are mobile workers. There are applications. There are reasons this needs to happen. A proxy for this market is SIP trunking. For the enterprise market, if they don't turn on SIP trunking, they don't buy into the fundamental value proposition that moving voice from TDM to IP is what I need to do. And once you move it to IP, you start down this cycle of, wow, this is great. I just saved a lot of money. I just consolidated my infrastructure. What else can I do? People want to do neat stuff. People want to invest in new stuff. They want to be recognized and they want to contribute. It starts in the enterprise with SIP trunking. Now, last but not least, and I do say not least because mobile is really a tour de force in our industry. Let's look at it a couple different ways. There are 6.3 billion endpoints on the PSTN, the public switch telephone network. Of those 6.3 billion, 5 billion of them are wireless. We actually have one customer here. Most, most of the larger customers are large public um, service providers. This one will remain nameless, but it is a large public service provider. And they file 10Ks and 10Qs. These are their annual reports. And I tend to think of them and interact with them as at least as much a wireline company as a wireless company. In fact, I bet they have more wireline employees than they have wireless employees and have at least as many subscribers. Yet 94% of their operating margin comes from wireless. So this is the cash cow. This is what we pay for. I pay 40 bucks a month for my mobile telephony integrated into my iPhone, I think. The company does, but I'm just guessing it's somewhere. <laughs> right, I don't even, but, but you get the point, right? That's not going away. But just imagine that you were operating a business where your cash cow had hordes of people with money in their fists, and you couldn't get them through the doors fast enough. You're turning them away. And that's the world that we live in, in, the, in mobile telephony. This is really important. And this is from Cisco, which I think is actually probably the best and least biased perspective. I did run this through um, a gentleman that runs one of the largest wireless uh, labs in the world, wireless networks in the world. And he also runs their labs. And he did the math. I don't even know how he did the math. And he added it up and he said, yeah, that's about right. Well, you, what, what's amazing about this is that people are scared. Why? Because the networks are already oversubscribed five years from now in their minds. You know, you do get a 10, a 20, a 30-fold gain. I don't know. I, you get a big gain. I'm just a user of this stuff, but Patrick could tell you what the exact number is. But that gain is going to be more than offset by the amount of bandwidth people are going to use. I mean, who ever heard of a market where you discourage your early adopters? The, the first people that want to use your technology, there's nobody else on your networks, and you charge so much because you are fearful. You know what's going to happen, which is you're going to screw yourself four years from now with whatever pricing you give them now because they're going to want to have the same pricing. 
Uh, uh, the example I'll give you is that I wanted to buy the iPad 3. The iPad 2 just didn't do it for me. I loved my iPad 1. By the time the iPad 3 came out, I said, okay, I want to buy this. So I got online and I tried to figure this out. And the first thing I had to figure out was, do I buy it from AT&T or Verizon? It's pretty darn complicated. You can flip a coin or some people talk about radios and coverage. But, so I made my choice. I'm not going to say what choice I made because I love you all equally. It's, um, <laughs> so, so, I, so, I, so, I, so I flipped the coin and, and, and you know, I, I, I have someone that helps me out. Her name is Tara. So she's sitting next to me watching this insanity. And I, I then say, okay, if I want to buy it, black or white? Well, that's easy. I, I picked black. I just like that. It looks, looks cooler for me anyway. And it look, makes me look slimmer. And so, 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 so after, after I pick the black, I then have to pick a data plan. And I don't know what the data plan is. The last time I did this, I just charged it to Acme Packet. And it was an unlimited data plan. It was like 20, it was $29 a month. And every single month, I get billed the same thing. And so I'm confronted with this choice of, is it one gig? Is it two gigs? Is it five gigs? I don't know how much I use. And so I did the only thing I could reasonably do. I took out my iPhone. And I figured out over a process of about four or five minutes to, to look at just how much data I had downloaded in the last year since I must have rebooted this, the thing. And I downloaded something like 6.5 gigabytes of data. OK, that seems like a lot. So I said, wow, 6.5 gigabytes of data. Well, I think the two gigabyte plan must, I'm not going to use all that. That would be great. So I'm getting ready to sign up for it. And then Tara says, you know, what are, what is, what's your family going to get you for your birthday? And I was like, ah. So I'm not getting the iPad, because that's what they got me for my birthday. I could see the future. It was four, four weeks in, into the future. I said, all right, I'm not going to get it. But I watched. I just watched to see what happened over that weekend. And my father keeps sending me articles and everything else. People are blowing through their data plans, blowing through them in one weekend. Now, part of the reason is some people are just plain brain dead. I mean, one person used it as a nanny cam. They're 40 feet from their kid in an apartment, and they turn on the, uh, de the device, and they're going over the LTE network back to the terrestrial so they can I mean, it's crazy. Of course, you, you, you should pay a lot of money if you're that stupid. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, you know, I mean, it's like, OK. But, <laughs> but there were other people that just blew through their data plans because you actually consume more data. Now, part of the reason you consume more data, better screens, better application, we shift more of our public and private lives to these devices. But the other reason we consume more data is it is just faster. 650 megabytes per hour, you start, the average person starts to consume using this. So you can see that they're afraid. Their networks are not fully used. They're not fully up. And when you look at where we really are in LTE, 2013 is going to be a very small year. 2014 is when the ramp begins. Why the heck wouldn't you want to encourage your customers, your early adopters, to use more data and pay a little bit more? And the answer is clear. They're afraid. They know that nature abhors a vacuum. Unlimited bandwidth is forever a myth. And this bespeaks complexity. It bespeaks uncertainty of business models. So we're in the very early stages of this mass migration. And some people want me to quantify it. It's very hard to quantify for several reasons. First of all, it's very regional. So let's talk about North America, loosely defined as the United States and Canada, is how, how Acme Packet is organized. I think we're about 28% penetrated in terms of VoIP. And that's delivered from the incumbents. It's delivered from the attackers in terms of cable and alternative access, as well as the over-the-top folks um, like Skype and Vonage. The business line trunking, I always say, you know, for this year has been less than 10%. And Seamus has given me numbers that it's less than 7% in North America. In Europe, I'll bet it's less than 1%. And in EMEA, and in CALA rather, and APAC, I bet it would round to 0%. This is an enormous opportunity. And then, of course, you've got mobile. I think that of the 302 million mobile devices in the United States, maybe 1% of them use some type of VoIP. I mean, really, until you have IP origination over the air, you're not going to see VoIP on these mobile phones. But you will very quickly. When, when Apple comes out with an LTE phone, watch out. Samsung's going to follow suit. You're going to see this conversion. Now, I don't know about your all businesses as much as I know about our business, but for something that's probably blended at 5% global penetration or less, we've shipped $1.1, $1.2 billion worth of product globally. 
So I think that when we start looking at a 20 or 30 billion dollar market opportunity over time, and that's just for the infrastructure, that's not for the professional services, that's not for the other adjunct technology, that's not, that's not for the services that you all are going to offer, you begin to realize this is not a small, insignificant opportunity. And Cisco, and Ericsson, Ben Verwein at Alcatelus, and John Chambers at Cisco, the folks that run Ericsson, Huawei, they get it. Microsoft really understands the importance of being able to monetize the desktop that they own. Microsoft will not go the way of Wang. And so everyone's fighting for this. So here's the vision, because it's actually a bold vision that is rooted in what's happened in the past, because I do think that history by and large repeats itself. Different flavors, different colors, but pretty much the same thing. So I still interview just about every person we hire for North America. I mean, it was just, there was craziness where I would, you know, even people who were hiring Poland would fly them over to the US. I mean, the, the standards are pretty high at some point. I mean, some, some guy or gal decides to fly 24 hours. It, it's, it's a long time. So I, I've, I've outsourced that to Mario and his group, and they do a great job. But I really care about the culture. Everybody you meet here, you're going to like. And I get told, wow, such a great group of people. Well, it's because someone like Patrick has told me that an enterprise is nothing more than a collection of souls. And a great enterprise is nothing more than a collection of great souls. And Acme will do its part. We need you to do yours. We will walk lockstep, and we will field people who are empowered. We will field people that understand and have the right kind of character that you can depend on to partner with you for the next five years. I sit down, and when I interview these folks, um, every so often I get asked a question that causes me to think. And I prefer the provocative questions. And someone said to me, um, so what's going to happen after you've done selling SBCs? I mean, it's, it's kind of a niche market. And what happens after that? And I, I was like, wow, that's a really good question. So I said to him, I want you to, I want you to play a game with me in your mind. We're going to go downstairs. We're going to walk out in the parking lot. And there's a little yellow whirly bird contraption. And we're going to get in that whirly bird contraption. And we're going to go. Why, you know, we're going to whip around, and after about four minutes, it's going to stop. It's going to wind down. We're going to get out of that thing. We're going to be dizzy. Hopefully, we'll figure out how to make it through the front door. We're going to walk back into a building, and I'm going to sit in front of you. I'm going to have a, a computer here. And you're going to say, what the hell is that? And I'm going to say, it's a router. You say, what's a router? And I'm going to say, you know, a router, it connects networks, connects IP networks. And the funny thing is happening. It's 1992. We went back 20 years into the past. Enterprises recognize the value of an application called email, and they start packetizing their infrastructure. And it's purely for an internal communication between their folks. And then they figure out, wow, you know, if, if I connect my email system to my law firm's email system, and they connect it to my vendor's email system, we can all coordinate and share emails. It's pretty darn cool. Well, you need a router to connect one enterprise email network or an island of IP with another enterprise's email network. And so the, the candidate might reasonably say, we're 20 years in the past, we're sitting here at Cisco, how many enterprises are really going to do this? And of course, it would be very bold and very difficult to say every single one, every single one. And so what happened is a routed network was built out because of email, because people wanted to connect their infrastructure with one driving application to everyone else's infrastructure with one driving application. And when a layer three routed network was built out, something wonderful happened. A network effect ensued, innovation was let loose, and oh wow, Google, Skype, Zynga, Amazon, eBay. I can keep going. We have never seen the wealth creation in the last 20 years. I mean, you have to go back to the railroads in 1860. And it's because a routed network, ubiquitous communications, and loosely designed standards allowed for value creation and monetization of that potential. Pretty darn amazing. In fact, today, email is less than 1% of what flows over that routed network. We couldn't imagine the rest of it. So now I say to the candidate, let's go downstairs, get in that same whirly bird. Let's go the other direction. Four and a half minutes later, we get out. We walk into the office. We climb upstairs. And I say, here, look at this. It's, 19, it's 2012. And he says to me, what's that? And I say, it's a session border controller. And he says to me, well, what's a session border controller? Well, a session border controller is a device that allows people to connect their networks together. Because what's happening is that every single enterprise and every single service provider is converting to packet for voice. 
Now, initially, it's internally. For the last 10 years, IP PBXs have outsold PBXs, but they all connect to TDM gateways. For the last 10 years, soft switches have been converting the transport within a single network from TDM to IP because it makes more sense. But we're all still islands of, of, of void. And it's my contention, it's pretty obvious, I think it's, you know, you're sort of preaching to the converted, I get it, but the point is, is that everyone's going to connect their networks up because IP origination, IP transit, and IP termination have enormous value. And once you build these, this connected layer five network for VoIP to flow from source to destination and transit is all IP, you've actually done the same thing. You've built out a session layer network. And it is not about voice. It is not about voice. I recognize voice is still going to be the most valuable from revenue generation application for the next five to 10 years. There's no question about it. But five to 10 years from now, we're gonna be sitting here and it's gonna be a lot sexier. It's going to be a lot richer. It's going to be a lot more interesting. So I guess the first question is, how do we move the world's voice to IP? And then how are additional IP services delivered and monetized? Now, I feel sometimes like this is going on. And, you know, you know Shakespeare, what, what is it? If you have a thousand monkeys banging away on a typewriter for an infinite amount of time, one of the pieces of, of material they're going to produce is Shakespeare's Macbeth. It's, you know, it's, it is true, actually. I mean, you can permute the odds, it will happen. And, you know, I sometimes feel like if we had enough time, we would have the perfect version of IMS 3GPP release infinity. Now, I'm not here to diss IMS, actually. We, we're, we're in 150 different deployments, and we are committed to being completely IMS 3GPP version 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 compliant. No question about it. It is our bane. Now, why is it our bane? Because we collectively have a cross to bear that Google does not, and that sucks. But that's okay. You need to know what your strengths are, and you need to accept your weaknesses. And our weakness is that we need to provide interoperability, that we need standards where networks touch one another, that we can't provide service to one customer because they use FaceTime, but not to another because they use Skype. We can't do that. And so we do need standards, and we are committed to those standards. But the thing that we need to pay attention to is that that's not a plus, that's a minus. We have pluses and we can talk about those, but these kinds of standards create some level of complexity. And the problem with complexity is that the people that we compete with don't have it. They use open databases, they don't care about security or trust, and they make a pile of money. They have a lot of fun too, right? That's, our, our day is coming. But you look at Facebook and you look at Google. These are people that are completely, they, they don't care what happens across the network. They don't care whether you get bad service. They don't care whether or not you've got closed user groups. It's not, they don't care. So for us to help our service provider and enterprise community really participate in delivering these kinds of innovative applications and services, firstly, it has to be simple. It just has to be simple. And you know, Patrick has been talking for the last four years about complexity is the enemy. And you know, uh, sometimes it takes me about three years of listening before I finally get it. I, I, I get it completely. It has to be simpler. It has to cost less. It, we, we need to develop solutions and provide these solutions to our customers and to the market that cost less. It has to be flexible. Now, you're going to hear us talk about things like SIP Trunk Express. Why? Because the cost of delivering a session border control a technology to a small enterprise is pay, the, the, the cost of the CapEx pales in comparison to the OpEx. It's so god awful complex. They need to be able to put software on a Linux computer and have it wake up and have it reach out to a SIP trunking provider and pull down configurated templates and make it work. It just has to work. And so we have this dream of a zero touch config to make this stuff work and we're committed to it. It requires our technology on both the service provider and the enterprise, we're gonna make it work. When we think about flexible and low cost, half of our business five years from now is gonna be software. Now, I, I say that at company meetings and right away the, the manufacturing guys start looking for jobs and I'm like, no, no, stop, stop. <laughs> We, we outsource m almost all of our contract manufacturing and these folks put it all together, make sure it works, and they do a wonderful job of delivering the technology globally. And we're gonna continue to see our purpose-built technology grow. But it's going to be augmented by hyper-growth of software. And what I love about software is it allows for flexible delivery too. 
If you want to get it from Acme on a website, go to a website and download it. If you want to get it from a VAR because there's going to be value add and the equipment that they're going to provide, the service they're going to provide you and some of the training, go get it from a VAR. But what's great is our commitment to software means that we are committed as well to flexible monetization. Subscription, product as a service, SaaS, there's all sorts of ways the future is going to emerge. I, 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 I don't know where it's going to go. But our commitment, when Dino says we are a forward-looking company, it's not just in the technology, it's also in the business model. You know, I have a dinosaur slide every single year, partly because I probably never grew up. And, you know, people, you know little boys, I like to play with dinosaurs. I, little girls probably do too, but I was only a boy, so I'm a sample of one. And, it, yeah, you can see I don't rehearse this. But, um, so, so this, I love this slide. I love this slide because it talks about cataclysmic change. It talks about something where the people that were in charge get dethroned. For 150, 200 million years, size mattered, always mattered. They always won, no question about it. And then one day, something that happens every so often, everything changed. And that's the same thing that's going on in our marketplace. And what, what I want us to think about, and I think it's really important because it's in the forefront of, of my brain, is that there, if I could build a missile defense shield, if I worked for that, for that dinosaur, and I said there's two asteroids that I want to stop, what would they be? Well, the first one would be complexity. We need to make sure that we don't take ourselves out of business because our customers say it's too damn complex. I understand the benefit of trust. I understand the benefit of quality of experience. I understand I can dial 911, but you know, I can barely implement it. And when someone has a problem, it costs me more to resolve it, and I pissed off my customer than if I just said, heck, just do it over the top. And so I am a huge believer that people are not going to connect their homes and expose their enterprise devices and take their cell phones and just point them to the wide open internet for unfettered ubiquitous communication where it's free and anonymous and life sucks. Because when my phone rings as much as my email gets spammed, it's just not going to work anymore. But we need to make it simple. Business models, huge complexity. How are people going to make money? The different technologies, the endpoints. Make no mistake that Apple's going to do everything they can to make their devices not work with Microsoft. And that Microsoft's going to do everything they can to not make it work with Samsung. And then you've got Cisco and you've got Avaya that each hate one another, even though they keep hiring each other's employees. I, that's interesting. But, they, but they, hate one, they hate one another, and so they're not going to make their stuff work together. And then you've got the Peter J. Minahan, our chief financial officer, enterprise risk management issue of, well, that corporate computer, that computer is a piece of corporate property. You can't put any personal data on it. He is right, but that's so 2000. <laughs> right? I mean, right, right. I'm not getting my check in two weeks. That's the real problem. <laughs> but, but isn't it? It's really incredible. We, as, as we use multiple devices and this blurring of personal and professional, it becomes really hard. Goldman Sachs, I believe, the last guy I talked with Goldman Sachs, said they just give their employees you know, $2,000 to go buy a computer. They don't care what you buy, and they tunnel in, and you, that's how they control their experience. So whatever's on your computer is yours. Everything else is in the tunnel and back in the network. This is going to get more complicated. We are committed to lowering the resistance of complexity to make it simpler, because stuff won't work unless that happens. Here's the other one, innovation. We fail to innovate. We will sink like a stone as an industry, and every one of our companies is going to cease to create value. We are in business because people want to do new, different things. Now, Here's the interesting thing about innovation. I think there are three elements about innovation. Number one, where there's the least amount of friction. Two, where there's the largest pool of participants that can engage in, 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 in this innovative activity, because people do it inherently want to be creative. And three, where they've got the best and easiest and largest monetization opportunity. Right? So is that the telephone network? I don't think so. The telephone network, I mean, you got 12 buttons on the interface, and God forbid you actually try and interact with an STP as a developer. The feds or the Public Utility Commission show up at your house, and it's how are you going to sell it? So consequently, you see no innovation happen there. But what about the internet, right? You get three guys, a gal, a dog, six pack of beer, a couple pizzas, and pff, you can change the world. 
You can do something that you know you don't have to spend a lot of money doing in terms of creating it, and then you put it on the network and it can go viral and you build Facebook. Facebook created more enterprise value in the last seven, eight, nine years than every single service provider in the world added together. You go back to 2003, I'm making this up, but it's probably true. You go, you go back, it's the thing about debating, you just make it, at some point you vote and you're done. But no, I think if you, if you really did this exercise and you went back to 2003 and you looked at the market cap of these service providers and you look at where it is today and you added that delta together for the top 25, 50 or 100, and you saw how much additional enterprise value was created, and then you looked at what Mark Zuckerberg and four or five people created, and it's astounding. And it ain't about Facebook. It's about LinkedIn. It's about Zynga. It's about Twitter. It's about Foursquare. It's about all these things that we can't imagine. All that innovation needs to be something that we take advantage of, that we don't live in fear from, that we don't see as competitive. It is the wave. You cannot fight the wave. You just can't. What you need to do is surf the wave. And I was at a conference recently, and uh, Paul Silverstein, who's an analyst for Credit Suisse, raised his hand and you know, said, Andy, I have a question for you about, face, about FaceTime. I said, go right ahead, Paul. And he said, so on FaceTime, are you guys involved in that? And we said, no, it's, it's a closed thing, works between Apple devices. He said, isn't that a problem? Doesn't that scare you? My answer is, absolutely not. I think FaceTime is one of the best things for our business and our industry. You see, every 10 or 20,000 years, the magnetic poles of this planet shift. I mean, like north becomes south, south becomes, it's crazy, right? We, it just happens. Well, that happened in our industry in the last 10 years. Just a magnitude. We, in fact, a company that was worth marginally more than we are is the most valuable company on the planet because they took advantage of and maybe they facilitated that trend and that's Apple. That's the whole BYOD, bring your own device model where this, you got the consumerization or the personalization Marion talks about of, of IT, of information technology. It used to be that you got your computer, you got your phone and your technology from work and then you brought it into the home and that's how it worked and sure enough we've seen a reversal of that where people are bringing their own devices to work and that's unbelievable. That changed everything. Well, these devices aren't bricks. These devices are computational devices with huge amounts of bandwidth and with great input and output display mechanisms or interfaces. So what are these devices carrying besides germs? These devices are carrying applications. BYOD, I don't care about. BYOA, I really care a lot about. Because the device is a device. You can hook a device up to your network. If it doesn't do anything, you just need a firewall. But when you want it to have access to your service infrastructure, when you want it to participate, when you want to have quality of service and regulatory compliance, when you want to have ubiquitous service reach so that the devices your employees are bringing to work and the applications they're running will work regardless of the customer's, you know, the customer's device they're using to communicate with you on. And so the point is that we need to celebrate and look at and facilitate the over-the-top innovation because that's where it's going to happen and find ways of harvesting that, whether we are serving consumers, mobile, mo mobile users, or enterprise customers, we can, we can look at that, harness it, and harden it. And hardening it means doing things like putting a best efforts IP transport for that application onto a session delivery network. And all of a sudden, when you have the big boss come to work and point to his website because his kid was using it over the weekend, and he says, how come I can't do that with my customers? You can say, well, you can. That is the way we are going to win. And it's going to be so much more fun, partly because winning is really fun, but partly because this is about innovation. It's about doing different new things better. So the last thing I want to leave you with is what guides us. You know, everyone needs a compass. And, and, and so if you ever wonder what does ACME stand for, here's what we stand for. We want to sessionize the global IP networks. Absolutely not every communication is going to be session oriented. Is it 10%? Is it 50%? I don't know what the number is. But I do know that there are going to be two ways people communicate. It's going to be all IP, whether it's wireline or wireless, doesn't matter. Secondly, it's either going to be best efforts where the IP transport network is providing loosely federated, um, in, you know, standards-based connectivity, it's best efforts based, packet loss, latency, and jitter and path selection are all done by the layer three network, or it's going to be session oriented, 
where there is going to be an overlay, an architectural overlay that leverages that IP network that lets people do just simple things. It only takes a few tools to build a temple. And when you think about the tools that were available to Mark Zuckerberg and the, what they built with Facebook, we're adding just a few more tools. You can select a path. You can enforce that path bi-directionally. You can promote that path over oversubscribed access infrastructures, and absolutely there will be. You can secure the service elements that need to participate along the way. You can normalize what you need to normalize because people are going to adopt SIP and other signaling protocols very differently. You can take care of media issues because most of these handset vendors are going to invent new protocols, new codec schemes at will because they're going to try and leverage their own advantage by being perhaps a little bit different or closed. So we want to connect devices across the existing layer three network and we want those devices to connect to one another and to connect to application environments and participate in community. We want to do it in a way where you can manage it where you know what's going on. When something is about to break, you get an alert. When somebody calls you up and says, hey, I got intermittent audio quality on this call or this video communication, what's going on? And it's not just a bunch of packets being spit into a cloud like dust. It's actually something that feels like a constraint-based deterministic connection across a distributed packet route environment. Most investors don't understand that, but that's what I do say to them too. This is what Acme Packet stands for. And you know, I do not believe in altruism in business. Acme Packet is not altruistic. This is where we want to go. I don't want anyone out there to be altruistic either. I do want you to know that we can be a great partner of yours, that we will continue to invest. You're going to hear from um, Alex and Uli, and their company is here today, um, Iptigo. And we purchased them. Um, well, actually, they weren't for sale. We convinced them to hitch their wagon to our train. And it's a 1 plus 1 equals 7. Because you know, there's things that we're good at, and there's things that we just aren't. And we're not good at making things simple. We've done a great job of making complicated technology designed for engineers that we could sell to other engineers that were going to implement this technology to solve a problem. We're very good at that. But we're not good at the simple part. And the simple part is one of those two meteors. These folks are going to help us build out a center of excellence. And we're going to start focusing on simplifying what we give you so that when you deliver your products and services, they actually work in a way where someone has aha moments and very little friction. So I really want to say thank you. This is, it is such a pleasure to participate in this community. I think that the next four or five years are going to be transformative. And if you want to get an idea of what being at the right place at the right time with the right level of community, with the right level of commitment can do, go to your Google stock charts. I, I don't like to use stock as a proxy for things, but going back in the past, this one works. Go pull up EMCs, go pull up um, Intel, and go pull up Apple stock charts. Not their price today. Go pull it up for the first 15 years they were public companies. The first 15 years. And what you're going to find is pff, it was pretty blah. These three companies are part of the world changing. They are enormous. The, 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 the smallest market cap is $30 billion. The highest is $600 billion. So we need to be careful to not lose our way. We need to believe, stay focused, and stay a community. And the opportunity is mind-boggling. And none of us know what's going to happen. But I am certain that if I'm building an application, or I am selling a device, or I am offering a service, or I am using something, and I have the choice of it being best efforts over the top and it's Netflix, I'm OK. But if it's something where I care about service reach, security, trust, identity, where I care about path selection, where there's any economic association at all, I think I'm going to want some of the tools that a session delivery network can provide. So I want to say thank you. I'll be here for the next couple days. And I think that there's probably some sort of a, holy cow, I'm 44. I, this is like right on time. Um, oh, it's the break? I didn't talk through the break, did I? Because then everyone would hate me. All right. Well, so I guess we're taking a break. Thank you all very much.